Greetings and welcome to this latest edition of Farhang Connect Live. I am Ali Reza Ardakani, Executive Director of Farhang Foundation here in Los Angeles. We are a member supported, non political, non religious, not for profit organization with the sole mission to celebrate and promote Iranian art and culture for the benefit of the community at large. Thank you for joining us this morning from all over the world for Attar, the Unending Thirst, an artistic collaboration invoking the timeless wisdom of Attar's masterpiece, The Conference of the Birds. Today, we are delighted to welcome an exceptional panel of experts to discuss this great artistic collaboration with us. Our first guest is renowned author, playwright, and poet, Shole Wope. Ms. Wope was named a 2020-21 Cultural Trailblazer by the City of Los Angeles. Her literary work numbers over 12 books and several plays. Her most recent book is The Conference of the Birds. Ms. Wope has performed her literary works with musicians in Singapore, India, the United States, Indonesia, and Australia. Her awards include a Penheim, a Midwest Book Award, and the Lois Roth Endowment Persian Translation Prize. Her plays have been finalists or semi-finalists at numerous festivals and conferences, including the Bay Area Playwrights Festival, the Eugene O'Neill National Playwrights Conference, the Centenary Stage Company Women's Playwrights Series, and the Ashland New Plays Festival. Presently, Ms. Wolpe is also the author in residence at the University of California, Irvine. Our next guest is Fahad Siadat, who is an advocate of innovative and adventurous music. He approaches his advocacy as a performer, composer, conductor, and entrepreneur. He has performed as soloist with LA's groundbreaking opera company, The Industry, The Parch, and The Twilight Orchestra. As a composer, his music has been performed in Europe, China, and across the United States. Fahad is the artistic director of the Hex Vocal Ensemble and is the co-artistic director of the Resonance Collective. He has conducted choirs at Columbia University, Cal Arts, and the Chafee College. In 2012, he founded CA Dot Music Publishing, a company devoted to advocacy of adventurous choral music. And last but not least, our final guest today is Andre Megerdichian, who has worked with such companies as the Limon Dance Company, the Dance Kaleidoscope, the Mary Anthony Dance Theater, and the Janice Brenner and Dancers. He has served as a faculty member at the Limon Institute in New York City, the Duncan Center Conservatory in Prague, and he has created choreography and thought master class and workshops throughout the United States, Europe, and China. An assistant professor at the University of South Carolina and co-artistic director of the Resonance Collective, his work is rooted in the humanistic, highly physical explorations of modern dance traditions while exploring the diverse tension and curiosities of today. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our esteemed guests to today's Fahan Connect. Good morning, Shole. Good morning, Fahad. Good morning, Andre. Welcome to Fahan Connect. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Well, I'm going to step back now and let Shole John take over from here and uh, start the presentation. And uh, again, I will be back towards the end of the program where we will hold the Q&A. So please submit your questions through the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. Um, see you soon. Hi, uh, my name is Shole Wolpe. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Farhang Foundation uh, they do much, a lot of significant work, and it's an important organization. And thank you, Ali Reza John, for your dedication and talent. I'm here with my colleagues, 
composer Fahad Siadat and choreographer Andre Megerdichian, with whom I have embarked on a great journey in which we will bring you the beauty and wisdom of one of the world's greatest masterpieces, the Conference of the Birds, in Persian, we say Mantogotair, as a soul embracing oratorium. More about that later. But first, let me introduce you to Atar, the poet, and his masterpiece, and then we will tell you more about the oratorio. The Conference of the Birds is an epic poem by 12th century Iranian mystic poet. Attar, who was born in um, 1145. Rumi, who is a poet uh, the Western audience knows very well, Rumi called Attar the spirit and himself its shadow. Rumi said Attar traveled through the seven cities of love while I am still at the bend of the first alley. Now, who was Attar the man? A great deal of myth has been created around his life and death. Uh, what we do know is that he was born in Neshapur in the city northwest of Iran and supported himself as a pharmacist, a healer. And that in Persian actually means Attar. Of the 40 works that bear his name, uh, Around 10 are verifiably his. He completed the Conference of the Birds around um, 1187 when Attar was approximately uh, 40 years old. Now, Attar's spiritual focus on Sufi practices and ideas have made him one of the most important mystic poets in the East. Sufi philosophy, and that's important to know before we go on, teaches us that while the soul waits for its release from the prison or rather confined of the body, it can experience the other world through a mystic union. This union can be arrived at or rather achieved by going inward to purify the self. I spent three years translating or rather recreating this monumental work into modern poetry and prose. It is, the translation is poetic while accessible just as it was meant to be when Attar wrote it. It is published by W.W. W. Norton in the United States and is available worldwide. Now living with this work changed my perception of just about everything in life. And I hope it gives you the chance to do the same. Now very quickly, what is the story of the conference? I'm gonna read bits and pieces from the translation in the book. The birds of the world gathered from near and far. They said, no nation is without a leader. Why is it that we don't have one? A body without a head is without direction. Let's seek a sovereign without delay. And so they converged to seek a leader worthy of their nation of birds. Now, the wisest of them, the hoopoe, which is this bird with this gorgeous crown, steps forward and says, hear me, I know who is our great leader. I wish to go searching for that beloved, but cannot do it alone. Now the hoopoe says that there is this mysterious bird, Seymour, Seymour, who dwells in Mount Gough, which is a mystical mountain, um, a mythical mountain, I'm sorry, that wraps around the world. There, they will all achieve enlightenment. So the birds fidgeted anxiously now, impatient to gain admittance to the court of Seymour. Such yearning overcame their spirits that each one stepped forward urgently in love with the beloved and therefore an enemy of its own self. 
And yet each bird also feared embarking on such a long and distant voyage. Therefore, despite their eagerness, each came up with an excuse not to stay. And so every bird comes up with an excuse. The proud peacock wanted a home back in paradise. The duck was too attached to water to leave. The partridge could not leave its precious stones. The osprey is too proud. The falcon, which is very ambitious, uh, only wants its master's approvals and so on and so forth. And you know what? As we read the bird's excuses, we see how they are our own. Of course, the hoopoe answers each bird with great wisdom. It warns them about the dangers of ego, which it calls the cyclone of calamities. Wow, the, that cyclone of calamities is the ego. Now, here's one of, uh, uh, one of the passages that's really, really close to my heart. And it's an advice that is truly timeless and uh, relevant, especially today. So listen up. Whether you're an ascetic or a libertine, when you fall in love, your heart becomes the enemy of yourself and you'll no longer care about yourself. Therefore, let go of your ego. It's the world's, it's the road's end anyway. Ego is a dam that keeps you from the path. Give up your eyes so that you may see. If you're told to abandon your faith, who are you? to refuse. If you are told to abandon your faith or commanded to give up yourself, who are you to refuse? Renounce them both. Naysayers say, this is blasphemy. Tell them, love is above heresy and faith. What does love have to do with belief or unbelief? What do lovers have to do with life's trappings? Love insists on the heart's bleeding pain. Love demands a gnarled and arduous tale. Love is the magnetic core that draws everything together, but beware, there is no perfect love without pain. So then the bird says, staunch your fear and step forward. Leave faith and blasphemy behind. Don't worry, don't be childish, don't hesitate. Go on, be bold, take the first step. So the hoopoe tells the birds that in order to reach the great sea morgue, they have to journey through seven valleys. And these are, this is the part that we decided to focus on in our oratorio. Valley of the Quest is the first valley where the wayfarer, the birds, you and me must begin by casting aside all dogma, belief and unbelief. Um, he says, stand empty handed and the cleansing of your heart begins. Purge your heart of its own traits and the virtues of the divine will reflect in you. This is a difficult valley for so many of us. We have required, we are required in fact, to empty our cups of everything we hold to be true and untrue. And how can we gain something if our cups are full? So we have to empty everything we believe and don't believe in order to take this very first and monumental step. The second valley is the valley of love where reason is abandoned for the sake of love. In this valley, life, love is fire and mind is smoke. When love arrives, reason flees. The third valley is the valley of knowledge, where worldly knowledge, all of our, what we learn in schools and we learn in life, everything becomes utterly useless. Here, knowledge splits into unnumbered insights. One person finds it in a church or a mosque, 
another finds it in a shrine for idols. This is very important concept, the idea that the path to the beloved is not just one single highway. Each of us can and should take whatever road that, th that feels right, and then we can and we can, must not sit in judgment of one another. The fourth valley is the valley of detachment, where all desires and attachments to the world are given up. Here, what is assumed to be reality vanishes. Uh, Atar says here, the seven seas are but a puddle, the seven plains are just a spark. The fifth valley is valley of unity, where the wayfarer, us, realized that everything Everything is connected and that the beloved is beyond everything, including harmony, multiplicity, and eternity. He says, there is not a place, this is not a place for uniformity. Here you find unity in diversity. Unity in diversity. Now that's something we should put on every flag of the world. In fact, I recently learned that the European Union had adopted that phrase, and I wonder if they know where the phrase actually comes from. Atar says, there is an invisible sun hidden inside us all. The day will come when the veil falls away and the sun is revealed and shines. And in its resplendent light, all virtues and corruptions vanish. So long as you exist, there will be good and evil. And when you lose yourself, they will vanish too. The hupo then uh, warn, warns us. It, it says, beneath the curtain of your ego lies snakes and scorpions still asleep, touch them lightly, and they'll awake and rise like a hundred dragons. The sixth valley is the Valley of Wonderment, a piece of which later we will uh, show you in our oratorio. Here, we, the wayfarers, are entranced by the beauty of the beloved, and the wayfarer becomes perplexed steeped in awe, finds that he or she has never known or understood anything at all. Here there, is, uh, here there is fire, but it's frozen. There is ice, but it sizzles from pain. When you arrive here in wonderment, you arrive already lost and will be yet more lost. And finally, we arrive in the seventh valley, which is the valley of poverty and annihilation, where the birds experience complete annihilation of self and become timeless, existing both in the past and in the future. Now keep in mind that as the story progresses, there are many parables, many stories that are offered that help us digest and understand what is being said. For example, I want to read, because we don't have that much time, I'll read you one short one, one of my favorite parables, parables of the moths. The moths of the world gathered one night seeking to know the candle. They said, Let's send one of us to bring back news of it. A moth was elected and it traveled far to a distant palace lit by candlelight. When the moth returned, it opened its notebook and began to describe all it had observed and understood about the candle and its light. One of the moths among them, an eminent critic said, <laughs> This moth fellow has no idea what a candle is. Another moth was dispatched. It found a candle, flung itself toward the flame. Its wings fluttered against the heat. 
the candle conquered and the moth retreated. Barely alive, it returned to reveal a handful of mysteries relating its near unification with the light of the candle. Once again, the critic said, dear one, what use is this information? Like the other moth, how can you really know the candle? Another moth volunteered for the task. It found a candle, then drunkenly danced towards it and perched itself on the tip of its glowing tongue. As both feet touched the flame, fire flared and took the moth from feet to head. Its limbs glowed red as the flame. When the critic saw this from afar, how, saw how the man took the candle to itself and became one with its light, it said, this moth alone knows the candle. Who else can understand it? No one except the moth who became one with it. It's really a beautiful parable. So the birds finally take off and here's what Ator writes. They traveled for years, crossed deserts and mountains. They spent their whole lives traveling toward the great sea mark. Of the 100,000 birds, only a handful survived. And from them, only 30, only 30 arrived at the door of the great abode. Now, when they arrive there, <clears throat> something surprising happens something soul crushing. They're not admitted to the great court. Now, I won't tell you how they eventually figure out uh, how to get in because you're just gonna have to go there yourself and explore that for yourself. But I wanna share with you that last bit, what happens to them. I know some people say it's a spoiler, but it isn't, it's, it's so beautiful. In the end, as they fly towards the beloved, they make this striking discovery. They saw, they saw the face of Seymour, but in reflection. And when they looked closer, they saw the reflection was their own. Seymour, see more, which means 30 birds. Like a shadow that vanishes in sunlight, the birds surrendered themselves to the Great One and became utterly nothing. Silence fell as both the pilgrims and their leader became one with the way. Friends, we, we are the birds in the story. All of us have our own ideas and ideals our own fears and anxieties as we hold on fast to our version of the truth. Like the birds of the story, we may take flight together, but the journey itself will be different for each of us. With this chaos that we call our world today, chaos, this monumental work, the Conference of the Birds, has never been more timely and necessary. That's why when composer Fahad Siadat approached me about writing the lyrics for an oratorio based on the Conference of the Birds, I was immediately on board. Now, Fahad is a gifted composer and what he has done with this story is phenomenal. Imagine all the beauty and power of the story coupled with the soul embracing music that Fahad provides us. In fact, when we had our first meeting, uh, you know, when we're our first uh, uh, weekend long rehearsal, right before the pandemic, the singers told us, the three of us, that they felt they had gone through a spiritual journey. Wow, that's the power of the work. And so with that, I am going to hand the mic over to my um, colleague, composer, Fahad Siadat. Thank you, Shalija. 
This is such a remarkable story, and it's one that I, I grew up with. Um, you know, I was I was born and raised in the United States, and my parents come from from different parts of the Middle East. My father's from Tehran, and my mother's from Bahrain. But they both share a deep love of these stories and of Sufi philosophy, and it was a big part of of how I grew up, and uh, and it's a big reason why I got into music in the first place. For me, music is about touching and exploring those things that can only be experienced and not put into words. And in fact, uh, choral music specifically ha is one of those things where we get to taste um, a little bit of that disillusion of the ego, where you get to dissolve yourself in a larger group and into other voices. And this is very interestingly uh, recently been studied in neuroscience, where this this idea of group singing is a way to create a large sense of unity between people. And it's one of the reasons they believe that group singing is something that exists in every single culture. And it's a big part of my own work as a composer. So the idea of creating a music piece that's specifically built around choral music and around group singing made perfect sense to me because we don't want to just share the idea of the story. We want to share the experience of the story as well and create a little taste, a little moment of that sense of connection and disillusion, both for the performers and for the audience as well. So I want to explain a little bit about what an oratorio is. An oratorio is a, a form, it's one of the earliest forms of musical storytelling in the Western classical tradition. It predates opera. It is originally a form of unstaged opera, and it was typically done with religious stories, typically biblical stories. So large pieces like The Messiah um, by Handel or The St. Matthew's Passion by Bach or Elijah by Mendelssohn, these are all oratorios, <clears throat> musical stories. And typically an oratorio is made up of a choir that fulfills some of the character roles, an orchestra that provides the bulk of the music, and then soloists that step into the place of individual characters as the story is being told. For this piece, I wanted to create a musical story, but one that is not necessarily tied to a specific culture. The idea of bringing in an orchestra and all these things suddenly makes the piece much more Western. And as, as Shole was saying, this is a, a universal story. It's about the soul's search for truth, something that transcends culture and boundaries. And so like myself, a person who finds himself in between many different cultures, raised in the States, uh, in the States by parents from different backgrounds, I wanted to create a musical experience that matches that and can share the story without necessarily culturally specific baggage. And the voice transcends culture. Every, every culture uses the voice and engages in, in a vocal tradition. And so as part of this piece, while I have studied some Persian classical music, the bulk of my training is in the Western classical tradition and in, in various other forms of music. And so I've let all of those different musical ideas inform how this piece is being created. So just to, so you can understand the expectations, <clears throat> this is not going to be a Baroque style oratorio with, with orchestra and neither will it be a, a Persian classical piece with the setar and the dombek and based in the daska and the radif. It's, this is something that uses some of the underlying principles of those ideas. A lot of the music is drone, <clears throat> excuse me, is drone based, but also utilizes ideas from Western harmony and things like that. And instead of an orchestra, what we've done is use the different sound possibilities of the voice as a way of building the orchestral palette on top of which the soloists will sing and will embody different characters to tell the story. So we have the uh, a, a narrator character that is sort of almost like Atar telling the story. And then we have the hupo who is leading the birds on their journey. The chorus itself is the birds as a whole, and then a group of other soloists that step in place to embody specific birds or to tell the individual parables that show up throughout the epic poem. 
there's one big change that we have made to this, which is the addition of a dancer uh, and, and creating a, a physical vocabulary that uh, the choreographer Andre Megadician will talk about in, in a little bit. <clears throat> so what I would like to do is I'd like to share with you a little bit about how we have taken this very large epic poem, I mean, a whole book, Ashola John, you can tell me, I can't remember how many lines it is, something like 20,000 or something? Uh, no, it's about 5,000. Or 5,000 words. Okay, yeah. So 5,000 words. And Not, um, <clears throat> couplets. 5, oh, couplets. Okay. So about 5,000 couplets. And uh, as you can guess, it takes a lot longer to sing something than to read it. And we don't have days to sit down and read through this entire book while performers are on stage. So we have worked to condense this entire epic poem into a 20 page libretto, which is the script for an opera or, or an oratorio, trying to distill the most fundamental stories and concepts of the Sufi philosophy into the piece. So what I would like to do is um, I'd like to invite Andre uh, to, to come onto the Zoom with Shole. And what I would like us to do is we're gonna read the section of the, of, of the Valley of Wonderment, uh, an abbreviated section from the original text. And then we'll show you a musical example of that same section. And you can see how we've translated this, uh, the original poetry into a musical format. And you'll see there's some rearranging and, um, and, and some sort of different ways of manipulating the characters to tell the story. And the, the performance that you're going to see is actually by um, the First Congregational Church of Los Angeles, their professional choir. And they used this music and this poetry as part of their church service. So as Shole was saying earlier, this is an idea, a philosophy this, this yearning for, for the truth and for unity is something that transcends religious tradition and dogma and is, um, and is able to be incorporated into many different kinds of spiritual practice. So here is uh, a, a brief section from the Valley of Wonderment. Next comes the Valley of Wonderment. Here you will meet pain and unending remorse. Here, Every sigh is as sharp as a sword. Here, every breath brims with sighs. Here, there is fire, but it is frozen. There is ice, but it sizzles from pain. When you arrive here in wonderment, you arrive already lost and will be yet more lost. And if you stamp the seal of oneness on your soul, you'll drift even further in your lostness. If they ask you, are you drunk or no? Do you exist or no? Are you within or without? Are you hidden or manifest? You will respond. I know nothing, not even the breadth of my own ignorance. I'm in love, but don't know with whom. I am neither devout nor faithless. I do not know who I am. Of my own love, I am ignorant too. My heart, <clears throat> my heart is both full and empty of love. And next we'll have in the Valley of Wonderment, one of the parables. This is the parable of the locked door. A Sufi heard a man cry out. I've lost my key. Has anyone found a key? The door is locked and I am left outside, distressed. What should I do if it stays closed? What can I do if I cannot get inside? The Sufi told the fellow. Why do you make such a fuss? You know where the door is. So what? It is closed. Sit by the door and someone will eventually open it. Your situation is easy compared to mine. My soul burns in yearning. My trouble has no head or tail. There is neither a key nor a door. If only this wretched Sufi could find the door, it wouldn't matter a bit if it were shut, locked, or wide open. Once in the Valley of Wonderment, every moment is rife with restless discontent. You'll cry, how long must I suffer this confusion? You'll weep, when can I find my way out? You'll ask, how can I gain knowledge where others 
have faith. Now that you've heard this section once, we'd like to share with you a small musical example of this movement, and you can hear how it's been translated over.
Just to give you a, a little taste of what we're working on, um, the piece is not entirely finished yet. We've been doing it in stages, and we hope to have the premiere at the end of 2021, starting in Seattle and then in Los Angeles in the spring of 2022, just so you know. Um, so to talk a little bit about the physical aspect of the work and how we want to stage, stage it and bring it to life um, through movement, I want to introduce my longtime colleague and choreographer, Andre Megredician, who I've been working with over the last 10 years or longer, 12 years, can you imagine, um, work with this idea of how to bring music and the body together in a way that brings these stories to life through multiple dimensions. So please, Andre. Thanks. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, let's talk about humans. We have evolved to communicate through sound and movement. And when we harness those modalities to our imagination, then we create. So first we have the idea, then we articulate that idea, and then we take action, we move. And that's how the idea becomes manifest or arrives here in our physical world. And so that's, how poetry and music and dance become catalysts for transformative journeys. Uh, now, there's this tendency in modern culture to specialize. So Cholet is a poet, Fahed's a musician, and I'm a dancer. Uh, and we've spent decades honing uh, and refining these skills. Uh, so, I mean, I guess you could say, you know, between the three of us, there's over a hundred years of artistic specialization, right? And so that's a lot of delving into a mode for delivering these transformative experiences. Um, now, uh, typically in an interdisciplinary collaboration, uh, each participating medium will present simultaneously, but still it's separate, right? So, you know, you have the singers, and the text that they're working with, and then you have the dancers. And so they're happening, right? One is here and one is here, or however they're staged. And the audience is aware that there are, while they're being stimulated from a variety of senses, that there is still, and it's an awareness that, if, you know, if it's not conscious, it, it happens subconsciously. There's an awareness of multiple events happening at the same time. So when we look at movement, right, it's movement is primal. Uh, it's something that we experience on a visceral level. Um, you know, it, it's as easy as when you see two people truly in love and you see how they, how they sit together, how it's just the, just their physical uh, proximity tells us so much. And we, we feel that with them. We, we don't see or think they're in love. We feel they're in love. And, you know, anger translates the same way. Um, and maybe if we take the emotional aspect out of it, if you've ever watched people on a roller coaster, when they, when they reach that apex, then, you know, our, our, our hearts sort of pause for a minute because we know what's about to happen. And then they fall, they, plummet through space and then we we plummet with them and and so that that is that infectious or uh it's a connection that transcends the physical and with one human to another we experience we go on these journeys together uh and so what we're trying to do is to create a physical journey for the singers. So they, the sound and the visual experience is coming from a singular source. So now at the same time, we're gonna have a dancer and the dancer is, the dancer is the idea, 
right? So we, we've got the sense through all, through the, you know, what Shole has talked about and the music we've heard from Fahed, um, we get the sense of the journey, right? But the journey is all about an idea that we're seeking. And so the dancer, you know, by virtue of her specialization, moves differently than the singers, right? There's a slightly more ephemeral quality. And so in a sense, the dancer becomes the idea. And so we have the idea being sought and those seeking the idea. And that is how we're blending the physicality of the singers and the dancers and everything becomes one unified story, storytelling entity. Uh, so what you're gonna see, we're gonna show you a little clip of um, a, I can only describe it as a magical uh, weekend. It was our first, um, well, I guess so far only because we got a little interrupted by global pandemics. Uh, and so it was a, a magical moment where Fahed had just finished composing um, several sections and, and he had composed them, you know, obviously in his studio by himself. He hadn't had a, he'd never heard it before. And uh, I hadn't heard it. And so we gathered s s prominent musicians from throughout the Los Angeles area. And we took one of our dancers from the Resonance Collective and everybody came together in one room and the musicians were learning the music and we were experimenting with movement. And so we, we were documenting, you know, our creative process. Uh, and so what you're gonna see is just a few snippets of, um, of our experimentations. insightful talk and I know personally I learned a lot uh, 
um, about this uh, great work and your uh, upcoming uh, collaboration sounds really inspiring. So thank you. So without further ado, let's jump into the questions uh, as we have a few of them. Um, the first one is for Shole. How long did it take you uh, to translate this masterpiece to English? I think you mentioned it in your talk, but. Yeah, it took, uh, it took more, a little over three years of intense work and research. And it's been an award-winning translation. So for anybody who is interested in reading Conference of the Birds in English, we, I highly recommend uh, reading the book. Um, for Andre, how did you incorporate concepts and images of the Conference of the Birds for the stage? Oh, great question. You know, um, when, when you listen to the music, I, when, you know, for instance, when, when Fahed showed us that the clip of, of the choir in the church. You know, the music itself evokes a visceral response. And there is, you're immediately going on a journey. And, and so what, what I try to do is I'm listening to the sound that the head is bringing us. And then, and then I'm also listening to, to the idea that he's bringing us. And when and in that process of listening, then the body is compelled to act. It's pulled into motion. And then that's, that's how step by step the, the movement comes. So when we were in that, in that weekend workshop, um, you know, I'd never heard the music before. So there wasn't this, this chance to, to process and think, you know, there was just the moment, uh, a short amount of time, this window, we need to do something. And so, the listening, the listening is key. And then you listen, you listen from the outside and then you feel from the inside and then the movement comes out, right? And so then step by step, uh, we build that vocabulary. And then of course, you know, in any, you know, if it's really a collaborative process, it's like a conversation, um, you know, by yourself, your thoughts can spin and you can be like a hamster in a wheel. But as soon as you start to communicate with someone, then suddenly the idea that you might be circling on it explodes outward and it becomes something that you hadn't considered before and that's you know one of the things that we do for each other as humans is we listen and then we respond uh and and so the dancers and the sing the dancer and the singers in the room we were all in this process of being hyper aware of each other so the movement coming out it wasn't it wasn't for what would this be for a dancer it would be what are we doing? You know, these are singers, it's a different kind of creature. And so this is a movement vocabulary that we have to come to together, right? It's, it's a new language. And so they were directly informative in terms of how to guide the impulses from my body into theirs. That's fascinating to hear the whole inspiration and process. On that same note, we have a question for Fad. Um, what is your creative process to compose music inspired by a piece of poetry or another work of art? You know, it's, it's interesting, especially when I'm dealing with words. <clears throat> I, have the, I have the good fortune of being a singer myself, right? So I was one of the singers in the video clip that we shared. And so as, as a person who falls into the sort of performer composer category, a lot of my creative process is about building the music on my own voice. <clears throat> So there's a lot of um, improvisation that happens both at the piano and singing. And, you know, I've performed enough operas and oratorios and things like that, that after a while, my intuitive sense of how uh, the music is idiomatically written for the voice and my own aesthetic, my, my own like uh, musical idioms and harmonies naturally begin to combine. I mean, now I've been doing this for long enough, right? That um, <clears throat> some of these some of these parts, they sort of just flow and some of them get written very fast, maybe a movement in, in a single day or something like that, just by singing through the text once I have the basic musical idea down. Um, others it takes a little bit more searching and you have to try all the different possible combinations until the music reveals itself. A lot of this process is about channeling, just as Shirley was saying, removing my ego from the process and letting the story and the music be what it is. 
And when I'm wrestling with that, when I'm trying to make it something that um, it's supposed to be, it becomes very challenging. But when I allow it to sort of flow through me, the whole process becomes a lot easier. So, you know, similar to what Andre was saying about paying attention and responding to the people in the room and writing for their bodies, I am trying to listen and then transcribe the music as it comes through. Great, and I think it's, uh, like you said, you're, you're a singer yourself, so uh, that probably adds a lot more to composing. Then sounds great. Um, this one is, I, th I guess it would be great for Shole. Um, uh, the viewer is asking why Attar is not, doesn't seem to be as internationally known as Rumi. Um, what do you, and also what do you uh, want the audience to get away from this project? Well, he will be internationally known better than Rumi. Uh, I mean, this new translation, which is an accessible translation, is an accessible recreation um, done by a poet uh, is, is new, you know? So it's up to you to, to make it more internationally known and hopefully with oratorios like this, uh, you know, it will happen. It, it, is, a, it is a powerful work. I, love Attar, I love Rumi, but I love Attar more. And I think once you explore this work, uh, he, he will become your spiritual guide. Fantastic. Um, this question could be answered by anyone. Um, have you thought of bringing in some Persian verses or Persian calligraphy or anything Persian into the setting of this presentation? So it's, it's a great question. And this particular movement only had a little bit of Farsi in it, but there are other sections that use Farsi and the original poetry is sprinkled throughout the work. One of the things that Shole and I were talking about as we were putting together the libretto was trying to find those moments that are a little bit beyond translation or just don't make as much sense uh, in English as they do in Farsi and allowing the the original farsi to to come through in the libretto and just like a lot of persian classical music the rhythm of the language is so distinct it actually helps inform a lot of the musical ideas so it's not in in the section you saw and because those other sections haven't been recorded yet but it is um kind of integrated throughout the throughout the work great um, I think we're almost out of time. Uh, we got many more comments uh, congratulating you. People really love the music and the performance. And I think a lot of people are looking forward to uh, seeing this uh, program when it becomes available and we're getting people asking where they can buy the music. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of interest there. We had one person uh, mention that they're from India and they have been uh, interested in Rumi and Sufi, Sufi mysticism. And, but they had never heard of Attar. So uh, I think this was a great presentation to learn about Attar. Um, I, I wanna let everyone know that if you wanna stay uh, in touch with this program and uh, as they uh, update it, you can uh, go to conferenceofthebirds.info and stay in touch and update it on this um, uh, performance as it becomes closer to reality in person and stay in touch with all our panelists. And again, uh, the book, uh, Translation of Conference of the Birds by Sholei Wope, the award-winning book, is now available uh, on Amazon and all other uh, platforms where you can buy books. So definitely uh, check it out. I have to uh, once again thank all our panelists for joining us today uh, for this great talk. On behalf of everyone at Franklin Foundation, we thank you and we thank everyone who took this time to be, be, be with us this Saturday. Thank you and uh, have a great uh, rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.